So you just go straight to, um, what's it called? To that particular asset. Sorry, one second, please. You just go straight to that particular asset and uh, you know, uh, debit, um, um, you know. Okay, but in a case where you have, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, a group of assets, okay? When you have a group of assets, let me go to my marker board. I like writing, okay? So I'm not really comfortable looking looking at the, uh, at the, at the uh, what's it called? At the notes. I'm not used to uh, using notes to lecture, okay? So I, I want that to be free. So <laughs> so let me come back here. So I'm sure you, are, you, can see my, you can see my screen, okay? Please confirm you can see my screen at least. So that'll be sure. So, um, so what we wanted to do here is a cash generating unit. So let me use my screen here to uh, demonstrate that to you. Okay, nobody's confirming. So I assume uh, you can see my screen. If you have decided not to confirm, probably you are eating or something. I see your screen. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, so my, my students are eating. So they, uh, and they didn't call me. Can you imagine? Uh, cash generating unit. That's what they also call CGU, okay? So that's what they call CGU. So this can be some group of assets that generate cash inflows that are largely independent of other assets. Thank you for confirming. Thank you for confirming that you can see my screen, okay? So these are, these are a, a group of assets that generate cash inflows that are largely independent of other assets. So the issue now is this. Now listen to me here. These cash generating units are suffered in payments. How do I know? The kind amount of the cash generating unit is higher than its recoverable amount. So that means it has suffered in payment. So how do I now go ahead and um, allocate the payment loss on the ca on cash generating units? Remember, if it's one single asset, it's very easy. I'll just go to that asset, credit it, and debit POL. But in this case, it's not really like that. Now, IS-36 now give us procedure for allocating impairment laws, all right? Procedures for allocating, allocating, don't mind my handwriting, just listen to what I'm saying, right? Procedures for um, um, allocating, uh, what's it called? Impairment laws. Procedures for, sorry, sorry about that. Somebody is, 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 is taking my attention here. Uh, this student. Uh, okay, so procedures for allocating uh, impairment loss uh, to a CGU. Okay, there are three procedures. The examiner can ask you to explain. He can also ask you to compute it. Number one, impair obviously impaired assets. Impair obviously impaired assets. All right, I'm going to explain that. Impaired, obviously impaired assets to reduce goodwill to zero. Reduce, uh, sorry, reduce goodwill to zero. My brain is faster than my hand. All right, sorry about that. Reduce goodwill to zero. Okay, and uh, this is how it's looking like K. <laughs> reduce goodwill to zero and then um, allocate, allocate impairment loss balance, impairment loss balance, you know, uh, to other assets, to other assets, you know, on a pro rata basis. I'm going to explain all of that on pro rata basis. Okay, so that's what you do. Impair, obviously impaired assets, for example, the examiner can say, fire got a particular plant. It has now become worthless. That means it's zero. You write it off. Or half of it can be sold. That means you write part of it off. That is what they call impaired, obviously impaired asset. Then after you have done that, you now go to goodwill and reduce it to zero. In fact, the logic around I said six is if a cash generating unit has been impaired, most likely it is the goodwill that has suffered impairment. Okay. Most likely it is the goodwill that has suffered impairment. And as such, you have to 
reduce it to zero. So if there is a balance, you now prorate it on other assets on prorata basis. Okay, so I'm going to come back here. So let's go back to our, our notes so that I can pick a question uh, to demonstrate that we can move away from IS 36. And then we go straight to IFRS 5, asset head for sale and discontinued operations. So let's take a look at this question. Uh, let me see whether this question will demonstrate uh, what I'm looking for. I don't think so. We have the solution there, so you can go through that. I think I'm looking for a question uh, that will demonstrate that uh, the whole of that three principles. Okay, I think this is looking good. Okay, so let's look at question four. So let me try to see whether I have it in my note here. Uh, let me look for that question four. Did I really print it out? I'm not sure. Uh, let me see. Uh, what's the name of this question? Okay, that was an explosion. Okay. Okay, I think I should have it somewhere. Yes, I've seen it. Okay, so we are looking at question four. So wherever you are, I think on my own printout, I have it as question two. Okay, but let me confirm they are the same. Yeah, they are. So let me go back to my to my board so that we I can solve that question. So I'm going to read uh, on your own note. I think that's question four. But my own note here is uh, on question two. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, let me try to uh, clean the board like I always do. Yeah, fantastic. The board is clean. I think I would like to use a um, black marker. Okay, so let's see. All right, my hand is not really straight. So that's a problem. What matters is you understand what I'm saying here. All right, so uh, remember we are looking at, uh, okay, so let me read so that I can uh, give it a title. Now, there was an explosion in a factory. The kind amount of the asset were as follows. So we're giving good be patent machines, computers, buildings. The factory operates as a cash generating unit. An impairment review reveals a net selling price of 1.2 million uh, for the factory and value used at 1.95 million. Half of the machines has been blown to pieces, uh, but the other half can be sold for at least the accounting amount. The patent has now been superseded and now considered worthless. Required. Discuss with calculations. Discuss with calculations. How impairment loss will be accounted for. Okay. So normally, if the examiner decides to, to test CG, it can never hide it. You will always know. Okay. Unlike normal impairment for an asset, you may not know. You just say this because I can't teach me like last question we saw. Okay. And I've told you the trick for you to identify that. So you always know. So, but most times the examiner will ask you to explain the procedure for allocating impairment loss. Remember, impair obviously impair asset, reduce goodwill to zero, and allocate impairment loss balance or asset on parata basis. So that thing must be ringing in your memory. Okay. Now, in the next question, when I ask you, give you a question like this to apply. So, what are we doing here? So let's take a look. CGU factory, uh, factory explosion. Okay, I think I'm improving on my handwriting. I think, yeah, I'm getting used to it. Okay, so I will now say uh, allocation of impairment loss. That will be our title. Allocation of um, impairment loss. Impairment loss. Allocation of impairment loss. Uh, to a CGU in the exam, you write it in full, okay? Cash generating units, okay? So when you are doing this, you must create a column. You must create four columns. So you're going to say assets, okay? So you're going to say carrying amount before impairment. I'm actually managing space, okay? Carrying amount before impairment. So in your own, make sure you write in full. So we have another sign. So we'll now say impairment, impairment loss, okay? So we also have our, our Naira sign, okay? So you can have something like this. So we'll now say carrying amount after, carrying amount after, impairment, carrying amount after impairment loss. So you have something like this. So anytime you are doing 
cash or anything. This is what you need to do. Okay. Do you have to do this? If you don't do this, I don't understand how you're going to compute it. Okay. So we now you now leave. Them out, you know, we have goodwill, all right? What the figure for our, our goodwill? So the patent is um, how much? Uh, that should be 200, right? Then the machines are 300. Then we have a uh, um, uh, computers. Five hundred. Then we have a uh, buildings. Um, one five. So the total should be two thousand six hundred. Okay. So how will I know that this asset has been impaired? I quickly say current amount is um um uh, how much two thousand six hundred. Abi. The recoverable amount is how much. So I will ask the question, what's my recovery amount? He said, uh, an impairment review, an impairment review reviews a net selling price of 1.2 for the factory and value is used uh, in use is 1.95. So which one is the higher? Obviously it's 1.95, that is the higher. So that is my uh, recoverable amount. So this will give me impairment loss, okay? So that should be 650. Please confirm if I, I get that correctly. I just use my head to do that. Okay, let me quickly press the calculator. Uh, 26,1950. Yeah, it's correct. Thank you for confirming for me. Okay, yes, thank you. So now, so I have gotten 650. In fact, I love this question. It, it covers all the principles. So I have gotten 650 because in some other question, the examiner would have given you the figure for the impairment loss, okay? So if you are not giving, this is what you do. Now, I will now apply the principle. What is the first principle? He said, impair, obviously impaired asset. I will now look at the question. Is there any asset that is obviously impaired? So let's read. He said, half of the machines has been blown to pieces, but the other half can be sold for at least their carrying amount. I will now go to machine. Machine, you are obviously impaired. He said, half has been blown to pieces. So I will reduce you by half, okay? So that I can have 150 here because they said the other half can be sold for at least their accounting amount. That is it. That is what they mean by impair, obviously impaired asset. Then I read again. Is there any other asset that is obviously impaired? Remember, I have 650 to allocate. I have allocated 150. It remains 500. Don't forget. It remains 500. I will now ask again. Is there any asset that is obviously impaired? The examiner will tell me, he said, the patent has been superseded and are now considered worthless. Then I say, patent, where are you? I was told you have been superseded. You are now worthless. That means you are now zero, okay? I, I will write it off immediately. So I have written off 200 from patent. Remember, I have 500 left. How much is left now? 300. How do I get 300? 150 plus 200, that's 350. I remove it from 650, I have 300 left. I ask the question again, is there any answer that is obviously impaired? The, 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 the examiner says no. The question says no, that was the end. Okay, I will now move to step two. What is step two? Reduce goodwill to zero. I will say goodwill, whether you like it or not, I will reduce it to zero. Okay, so it becomes zero. Okay, that's the principle on IS 36 how to allocate impairment loss to a cash generating unit. So once it is zero, then I will now move to the last uh, procedure, which is allocate the balance, impairment loss balance to other assets on prorata basis. So which asset is remaining? Computers is remaining and building is remaining. What is the balance that is remaining? I think uh, that should be 200 because this is 150, 200, 100. Okay, so if I add this together, this will give me four, is that 450? So when I remove 450 from 650, I have 200 left. I will now allocate the balance to this other asset. Now listen, what will I do? I will now write it out. I will say computers, okay? Computers. What is the carrying amount of computer? You say it is 500. I will write it out. 
If I add them together, 500 plus uh, one five, it will give me two five. I have to add them together because I wanted to prorate. I will now say, is that two five? No, that should be 2000, right? Yeah, sorry. So that should be 2000. I will now say multiply by 200. How do I get the 200? That is the impairment loss balance that is remaining. Okay, that is the, yeah, thank you. You are following me bumper to bumper. That is brilliant. Okay, so when I compute, uh, when I perform my arithmetic, uh, I should have 150. Okay, okay, don't start telling the examiner two year one, two year two. This zero, we cancel this zero. You're on your own. You are wasting time. Okay, just go straight, press your calculator, and write the final answer. I will do for building. Okay, I will also do it for building. So what do I have there? I have uh, 1,500, is that, for, is that correct? Divide, the, uh, is that 2,000, okay? Then multiply by 200. Okay, that should be 50, right? I guess, I think this should be 50. Yes, that should be 50. So my brain is just telling me that, okay? So this should be 150 because at the end of the day, I must get 200. So if I add this 50 to this 150, it's giving me, it's giving me uh, 200. Okay, well, let me press my calculator to confirm what I'm doing. I'm just using head up and down. Okay, times 200. Okay, yeah, it's correct. So this is 50 and this is 150. So I will now come here. I will say, I will say for computers, you are going to eat 50. And uh, sorry, that one is circling itself. Uh, then here, I'll say 150. So when I come here, I will have 450. And when I come here, I will have, uh, is that 1350? If I add this up, it, it must give me this recoverable amount, okay? It should be 1950. So if I add this up as well, it must give me this uh, impairment loss. This is 650. So this is 150 actually, that one is just closing there. Okay, so that's it. So if you understand that, you are fine. And that is how to compute uh, uh, MN loss for a cash generating unit. So you have other examples in your notes, but obviously we can't, we can't um, you know, take a look at everything because this is an intensive class. So we really need to move as fast as possible. In fact, I actually targeted around 30 minutes for impairment, okay? But because I had, um, some slides are technical issues. I was also attending some students and all of that too. We couldn't, but at least we are still on course. Okay, so uh, remember, asset is impaired when the kind amount is higher than the recovery amount. So this is what we did over there, okay? This is what I went to do for you. So go and take note. Then there's another question there. You can also uh, take a look at it, okay? So let's go straight to our next standard. If you have question, feel free to ask. Go to the... Uh, uh, to the chat room um, and ask your question. Okay, I think there is no question. Please go and practice. Impairment is 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 always common. It's regular. And I can't question when it comes to financial reporting. Okay, so please take note. So let's go to IFRS five asset aid for sale and discontinued operations. Asset aid for sale and discontinued operation. I am using my assets. Normally, I use assets in production of goods or services or for admin purpose. In that case, I will apply IA 16, property, plant, and equipment. If I hold an asset separately for capital appreciation or to earn rental income, that is uh, either land or building or part of land or building or both. I will recognize or I take it as an investment property, okay? If I hold assets for sale in the ordinary course of business, then that is my inventory. IS2 will apply, okay? So now, and I'll discover that there are some assets that they are carrying amount. Remember, we have talked about carrying amount properly, okay? That's their book value. Can only be recovered through sale rather than continuing use. What does that mean? If I continue to use the assets, most likely I will not be able to, to, to recoup the carrying amount of that particular asset. If I continue to use it, the cash flows that the asset will generate will be much, much lower than its carrying amount. Then I can decide to sell the asset. Okay, so if I decide to sell that asset, IFRS 5 will apply. And that is what we call asset 
held for sale and discontinued operations, all right? So that means an asset can only be classified as held for sale if it kind of amount to recover through sale rather than continuing use. So what do you need to know here? Listen to me carefully. Recognition criteria. Before an asset can be classified as held for sale, two conditions must be met at the date of classification. Can I say that again? Before an asset can be classified as held for sale, two conditions must be met at the date of classification. Number one, the asset must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. I'm just trying to show you from your screen. Okay, but most times, even when I'm talking, I might, I might even speak you know, beyond the screen. So just take note, all right? So now, uh, uh, it, uh, the asset must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. Listen to me here. Before you can classify that asset for sale, what, is, what does that mean? It means there is no repair that will be required to be carried out on that particular asset. You can sell it instantly. It must be in a saleable condition. That is what IFRS 5 is saying. It's saying that the asset must be available for immediate sale. You have to sell it in its present condition, even though we are not selling it, but before you can classify it as held for sale. So that's the first thing you need to learn. Number two, the sale must be highly probable. So you can see it here. The sale must be highly probable, okay? You need to learn it, okay? Because it's going to come out in your exam, whether you like it or not, it will come out, okay? <laughs> the sale must be highly probable. So that's the second condition. IFRS 5 now say, for the sale to be highly probable, five conditions must be met, okay? For the sale to be highly probable, five conditions must be met. Number one, a proper level of management must be committed to a plan to sell the assets. Number two, an active program to locate a buyer and complete the plan must have been initiated. Number three, the price offered for the asset must be reasonable in line with its fair value. Number four, the sale is expected to occur within the next one year. And the last one, there is no plan to withdraw the asset from being sold. So these are the five conditions that must be met before the sale can be highly probable. So let me try to explain them. An appropriate level of management must be committed to a plan to sell the asset. What does that mean? If you're if you an external auditor, for example, and you are reviewing the financial system of a company, and you saw that they have classified certain assets as said for sale, you need something like board uh, minute of meeting. Where did they agree? What are the evidences to say they are committed to a plan to sell this asset? You know, here it's saying appropriate level of management, not just a senior manager, most likely to be the board of directors or senior management or executive management, all right, that have decided that this asset should be sold, all right? Then active program to locate a buyer and complete a plan must have been initiated. What does that mean? For example, if they want to sell a land or if they want to sell a particular property, maybe they have consulted a, is it a lawyer, a solicitor, a buyer, okay? So that's an active program. Or they have even gone ahead to advertise the sale in, in national dailies, newspapers, okay? So that's active program to locate a buyer have started. Then the price for that asset must be reasonable in line with its fair value. So if, for your exam, if the fair value of the asset is two million, then the the, the uh, what's it called the, uh, the 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 company must or the entity should also be selling it or be marketing it at two million. So that's what they are saying. Okay, so that's what they are saying. All right. Then the next one, uh, the sale is expected to occur within the next one year. So if they classify the asset as held for say December twenty twenty one, so that by December twenty twenty two they should have sold the asset, that's the meaning. But if they cannot, they, they were not able to sell it based on control that is beyond the management, they can decide to continue to classify it as held for sale, provided all these seven conditions are met at the reporting date. What's the, what's the meaning of reporting date? That's the balance sheet date. For example, December 31, if the accounting year starts from January, okay? Then there's no plan to withdraw the asset from being sold. What does that mean? You cannot say, I want to classify an asset as for say this year, so that next year I can withdraw it and continue to classify it as normal asset. No. 
so that must be that must be uh, it must be unlikely that you want to withdraw it from being sold so you need to understand that you need to understand that so don't forget you need to know all those seven conditions in your head and all the seven conditions must be met at the reporting date please take note so let's take a look at this question to demonstrate our understanding let's take a look at this question to demonstrate our understanding okay on 1st december 2003 a company became committed to a plan to sell a manufacturing facility and has already found a potential buyer the company does not intend to discontinue the operations currently carried out in the facility at 31st december 2003 there's a backlog of uncompleted customer orders the company will not be able to transfer the facility to the buyer until it ceases up, uh, to operate the, uh, the facility and has eliminated the backlog of uncompleted uh, uh, customer order. This is not expected to occur until spring 20x4 required. Can the manufacturing facility be classified as held for sale? Okay, now let me try to demonstrate how you answer this kind of question in your exam if it comes up. So I want to try to see if I have it in my printed note here so that I can go to the marker board and try to uh, explain it to you. Sorry, I'm still trying to look for that. Okay, sorry. Okay, I think I've seen it. Okay, so I can close this. So let me go to the marker board and try to demonstrate to you how you answer uh, questions like that. Okay, so I want to believe you can see, you can see my screen, right? Okay. Okay, now, where anytime you want to answer, uh, what's it called? Anytime you want to answer, um a, a theory question just like what we see in financial reporting you are going to do three things okay number one you are going to state the requirement of the standard state the requirement state the requirement the requirement of the standard okay you state the requirement of the standard that is involved number two Relate the requirements, relate the requirements, relate the requirements, relate the requirements to the scenario, to the scenario in the question. That's the question. So relate the requirements to the question in the scenario or to the scenario. Then three, uh, make conclusion, make your conclusion, okay? make your conclusion, that's what you're doing. Now, if you look at this question now, let's say we are in the exam, and the examiner says, can the manufacturing facility be classified as head for sale? So what do I tell the examiner? I'll first say the requirement of the standard. I'll tell the examiner to say, IFRS 5 requires that an asset can only be classified as head for sale if it is available for immediate sale in its present condition and the sale must be highly probable. That's what I'm telling the examiner, right? So I state the requirement of the standard. So that's why from tonight, you need to go and sit and start learning the principles of this standard. If you don't know those principles, you can't solve any question. It's as simple as that, because the, the examiner is going to test the principle. So the examiner will deviate from the principle and see whether you can identify if the company is complying with the principles in IFRS or not. So if you now look at this question, after stating that, I will now relate that requirement to the scenario. Now let's look at it again. It said, on 1st December 20X3, a company became committed to a plan to sell a manufacturing facility. So they have met one of the requirements. You know, we said, for the sale to be highly probable, an appropriate level of management must be committed to a plan to sell the asset. So they became committed. And in fact, they have found a potential buyer. Now, the company does not intend to discontinue the operations currently carried out. What does that mean? So that means that it's an operation that is currently carried out in that manufacturing facility 
that suggests that that facility is not available for immediate sale in its present condition. Did you see that? So that's how you relate the requirements, you know, to the scenario. And you're telling the examiner. So it means it's not ready. If I were even told that there is a backlog of uncompleted customer's order, and they will not be able to transfer the facilities to the buyer until they cease to operate. So just like you wanted to say your generating set, generator, and you're still using it. You can't be using it, but if the buyer wants to buy it now, can you release it? That's the issue. And you now say, no, I can't release it. I need to consume my foil that is inside the gen. So obviously, you, it is not available for immediate sale in its present condition. And as such, it cannot be classified as aired for sale. And that's the conclusion you are making. So we need to understand that. So any question is not limited to IFRS 5. Anytime the examiner decide to ask you a scenario question, okay? Sometimes those scenario can also involve, um, uh, what's it called, computations, all right? Okay, they can also involve computations. So if they involve computations, that means you'll be doing a, a little bit of calculation as part of the explanation. So that's what you tell the examiner. So it cannot be classified as held for sale. So let's move away from that. You can look at other questions. You have the solutions there. If you have issues, you have my, I'm not sure whether you have my contact, but you ask your neighbor. Your neighbor will have my contact. You can call me or send a chat to me. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Oh, sorry, you don't have a neighbor. This is online class. Oh, oh my God. Okay. So maybe at the end of the class, I'm going to uh, 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 um, send my number on the chat room so that I can pick it up and ask my question. I'm not sure the number is on that material you're having. Okay, so um, so that is uh, those seven conditions you need to learn for an asset to be classified as aired for sale. And that is recognition criteria. So let's go to measurement criteria. So let me use the opportunity to explain that. Measurement criteria, sorry, you are not seeing my face. I'm so sorry. In the next class, you're going to see my face, okay? <laughs> so just pardon me. Uh, you know, I've already started the class before. I have to move to the laptop soon. I, okay, maybe you see my face briefly. Let me see whether you can even see my face. But let's look at measurement criteria, okay? Measurement criteria for uh, IFRS uh, 5. What does that mean? Now, when the conditions has been met, Okay, when the conditions has been met, remember all those seven conditions. Even though in an exam, the examiner may not test all the seven conditions, except they ask you to list them out, okay? The examiner may not really test all the seven conditions, except he's asking you, you know, uh, to list them out, okay? So, hey, you ready, can see me. Gang, 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 gang. So this person has been talking earlier. <laughs> okay, now, uh-huh. So the, 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 that's exactly the way I was doing, even without the camera. Okay, so, so let me continue, right? So that you can see the way I just glitched. <laughs> okay, so uh, the examiner may not pass out the conditions you just learned, except they ask you to list the criteria on IFRS 5. Every other diet, IFRS 5 is always coming up. So I won't be surprised if you see it in, in your next exam. Okay, so now, Uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> okay, so now, so this is the issue here. If the criteria has been met, okay, and uh, uh, how do I measure? Measurement is value. What will be the figure I'm going to use to recognize asset ed for sale my account? So that's what is meant by measurement criteria. Okay, so asset held for sale. Let me tell you this asset held for sale. Asset held for sale. Asset held for sale are measured. Are measured at the lower lower of current amounts. They are measured at the lower of current amount and. Uh, um, value less cost to sell all right so that means 
I'm going to take a look at the carrying amount of that asset, all right? So I look at the carrying amount. I also look at the fair value less cost. So whichever is lower. So that is what I'll use to recognize the asset. So let's say the carrying amount of the asset is 500. And the recovery, uh, sorry, the fair value less cost to sell is let's say 600, okay? So in, which one is lower? Obviously 500 is lower. So I'll continue to carry the asset at 500. But let's assume that uh, the current amount of this asset is, uh, let me see, is a 500, okay? And uh, the fair value less cost to sell is 400, okay? So fair value less cost to sell, is lower. So that means I will write this asset down from 500 to 400 because 400 is lower. Remember, we are taking a look at which one is lower. So if 500, uh, 400 is lower, then there's a problem. So there's a problem of 100 because I'm writing the asset down from 500 to 400 and this 100 is called impairment. Did you see that? Impairment loss. So that's why we did ISS 6 earlier. I said, this is the foundation of financial reporting. So you need to learn it, okay? So if you learn it properly, you can, can play around IS5. Then the next should be IS10. Then we can take a look at IS37 provisions, all right? So that's how the sequence flows. Then from there, you can do IS20, government grant. You can do uh, 38, 40, and all of the IS13, fair value. Even though we may not be able to touch a bulk of them, but let's see how far uh, we can go. Okay, so that's in payment law. So that means you will now debit pure hell with 100 and credit the assets with 100 so that you can now have a 400. That is the measurement criteria. So let's see whether we can look at a question uh, to, uh, you know, uh, demonstrate that, okay? So that you can take a look at discontinued operations before the time uh, go so that uh, next class will start with IS-10. Uh, let me see. So you have the solution on, on all of this. So go and take a look. I have given you the principle. So go and learn it, okay? So this is what I was saying. So they are measured at the lower of their current amount and fair value less cost to sell. So if assets are in class asset for sale, they are represented separately on the face of financial position. They are subject to annual impairment review and they are no longer depreciated. Now, because they will be moved away from non-current asset to current asset, so you don't depreciate them, okay? Because they are expected to be sold in the next one year, and that's a current asset, so that's why they are not depreciated. So if you don't depreciate them, what does that mean? That means my profit for that year will go up. In an advanced exam, the examiner can ask you, how can you use RFIS-5 as earnings management. So that's why that condition is saying there's no plan to withdraw the asset from being sold. Because in a particular year that a company want to uh, report higher profit, they can decide to classify some asset as for sale so that they won't depreciate. And if they did not depreciate, the operating performance or the operating result or the profit for the year is going to be inflated or it's going to go up, okay? Then after that year, they can decide to reclassify those assets as normal assets as in its management, right? So that's why the standard is saying there's no plan to withdraw the asset from being sold. And the sale is expected to occur within the next one year, okay? It's just to avoid, uh, you know, uh, trying to manipulate the account. So let's take a look at this question and uh, let's see whether we can, we can solve it. Uh, on 1st January 20X1, uh, let me see whether I have it in my own printed note here, uh, so that I can probably uh, look at the question from here. Okay, so I can see. Okay, so let, but let me read it from here. 1st uh, uh, January 20X1, Michaco bought a chicken processing machine for 20000 That's an expected life of 10 years. On September 20X3, uh, 20X Michaco decided to sell. Did you see that? they decide to sell the machine and start actions to locate a buyer. So here, they have already met those conditions, okay? Now, the machines are in short supply. So, Michelco is confident that the machine will be sold quickly. The market value as at this time is 13.5 and it will cost 500 to dismantle, require. At what value should the machine be stated in the account? So here, the examiner did not tell me, this is IFRS 5, 
Okay, he said, at what value? You know, I told you, measurement is value. You can even also say, discuss the accounting treatment is the same. He's also asking about measurement. So technically, they have met the criteria. So how do I measure it? So let's go to our board marker. Uh, I actually love to do that, even though I know it's taking a bit of time, but um, the bottom line is you really need to understand this because I know uh, some of you have not been reading, okay? So, and you have to start reading, okay? So um, let's see, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, let me, I think I prefer black marker. Uh, so I can use the red to highlight key issues, okay? So we're going to say uh, Mitchell Cole. Mitchell, what's the, what's, the, what's the spelling? Okay, Mitchell Cole, okay? Now, how do I know this if I said they decide to sell and they have started action to locate a buyer? Is that okay? So that's I five. So I won't bother about the criteria, recognition criteria, because they already stated it is met, even though they didn't mention everything. That's on the issue. And the requirement is already saying at what value. Then in my head, in the exam, I know that to measure IFRS 5, I needed two things, the calling amount and the fair value less cost to sell. Whichever is lower will be the new value for my IFRS 5, asset head for sale. Then I ask the question, where is my calling amount? The question says there is no calling amount. Oh, really? Because unlike the question we solved under S36, it gave us the calling amount. But here, he has not given me, but he has given me information that I will use to compute my current amount, and that is cost of the asset and the number of lines. Remember I told you earlier, when I said the current amount of an asset is you remove uh, accumulated depreciation and accumulated impairment losses from the cost so that I can get the current amount. So I will now ask a question. If you have not given me the current amount, obviously you want me to compute. I will now say cost. Then when I say cost, I will write the date immediately because the date is very important. So this asset was bought 1st January 20X1. Can you see that? For how much? It says 20,000. Okay. Remember, I just wanted to compute my current amount. I will now say depreciation. If I was writing this exam, I would have said accumulated depreciation, but because I'm teaching, okay? So let me try to explain. I will now come somewhere in my notes. I will say workings, all right? I needed to compute my depreciable amount, or you call it cost minus scrap value or residual value or salvage value. The examiner can decide to use any of those terminologies. So go and take note of that. Divided by number of useful life, okay? Divided by number of useful life. You see, when you know this principle, you will be on top of your game in the exam, okay? Because you already know what you are doing. Then I ask the question, what is my cost? The saying is 20. Then I ask, do you have residual value? He said, no. It is a nil residual value. Oh, fantastic. So my residual value is zero. So I'll say minus zero. If you like, you, you may not do that. Then I ask a question, what is the number of life of this uh, uh, particular asset? It says it's 10 years. Did you see that? It says it's 10 years. So if it is 10 years, my depreciation effectively is going to be 2,000. Did you see that? It's going to be 2,000. Okay, so that means I will depreciate this asset in year one by December, because when I buy in January, by December, I depreciate. Why am I depreciate? For about four reasons. Because of usage, because of passage of time, because of obsolescence, and uh, I think there's one more, usage, passage of time, obsolescence, and the wear and tear, okay? So that's it, that's why I'm depreciating. Even if you buy an asset and you didn't use it, and that asset is available for use, you have to charge depreciation, okay? Even though it's not generating cash flows, so you have to depreciate, all right? So how do you do that? Maybe you can, I can be answering that question some other time, okay? I will now say depreciation year one, okay? Depreciation year one, that is December 20X1, because I'm teaching, that's I'm doing this, okay? If I was to be doing this in the exam, I'll just, multiply by three or whatever years, I write a completed position, I move on. But I wanted to show you something. 
That's how I'm doing this. So depreciation year one, then depreciation year two, okay? Every year, I'll be charging 2,000, okay? Then when I come to year three, I will now pause. What happened in year three? Let's find out. He said, on September, on 13th September 20X3, Mitchell could decide to sell the machine, okay? September 20X3. That means I would have depreciated for December 20X1. I depreciated for December 20X2. That's year one, year two, you are seeing there. When I come to year three, I will now stop. If they classify the asset, I said for say, December 31, year three, I would have also depreciated for 2000. But it says September, okay? What does that mean? You know, I told you that as soon as an asset is classified as asset for sale, depreciation will stop. Can you remember? So that means I would depreciate up to the point the asset was classed as head for sale. I will now say nine over 12 multiplied by 2000, okay? How do I get nine over 12? January to September is nine. If the examiner says September one, that would be eight over 12 because that would be August and the following day is September one, okay? So because it said September 30th, so that's how it's nine. So when, when you now do that, you have something like one five, okay? So when I compute all of this, that should give me, is that 45? I'm not really sure. If I'm not sure, please tell me. So obviously this is uh, the carrying amount, okay? So this is the carrying amount of the asset. So the examiner did not give me carrying amount, So that's how I'm doing this. He has given me, I would have used it. I will now ask, what is the fair value of this asset? I will look at the question. You say the fair value is 13,500. Is there any cost to sell? Yes, he said yes. So the cost to sell is 500. Did you see that? The cost to sell is 500. If I net it off, I'm going to have 13,000. Now be with me here. Asset aid for sale are measured at the lower of the accounting amount and fair value less cost to sell. So between 14,500 and 20,000, which one is lower? Obviously it is 13,000. So that means I will now write the asset down from 14,500 to 13,000. So that's a difference of uh, how much is that? 1,500. Where do I take it to? I take it to profit or loss as what? As in payment loss. And that's the end of that question, okay? So you can see some other question there. So go and take a look at them and try to practice them, okay? Any question for me? The chat room is quite, is not really busy. So does that mean we are understanding everything I'm doing? Oh, that's fantastic if we, if we really, uh, understand okay and i'm glad about that so that's that so that's that so let's go straight to discontinued operations if you look at the title of the standard asset aid for sale and discontinued operations okay assets aid for sale um discontinued operation somebody is saying please we have not answered the question i have just answered the question okay instead we are talking about another uh, question. If you really followed me, I have actually answered the question. Okay. At what value should it be stated? That's 13,000. I said it. I said you write it down from 45 to 13,000. And the difference will be taking, that's one five, will be taken to profit or loss. Okay. So that's that. So you can see the solution. I think, can you see the solution here? Can you see? That's how we got this 45. I think we did it over there. Okay. So uh, find time. Uh, maybe before you sleep, before you sleep, uh, to, to look at it again. So let's go to discontinued operations. So what is the discontinued operation? This is not an asset. So you have an operation, okay? And when you say operation, it can be by geographical area. For example, you see Nokia, you see Nokia West Africa, Nokia Central Africa, and all of that, okay? So that could be an operation. So if you now decide to discontinue a particular operation, so what, what does that mean? So according to IFRS 5, a discontinued operation is a component of an entity that has either been disposed of or is classified as held for sale. So let's say in, uh, during the accounting period, your, your company has about five outlets and they are classified as operations, okay? They have about five outlets. Then during the year, they decide to discontinue one of them. At the year end, that operation will be recognized as discontinued operation. That's why I said 
is a component of an entity that has either been disposed of. So they have sold it during the year. So when they are preparing the account at the end of the year to be taken as discontinued operation, or is classified as aired for sale. So that means they've not sold it, but they wanted to sell it. So they class it as aired for sale. But before they can do that, that means that operation must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. We have learned it earlier. Okay, you know what we learned earlier was the asset must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. So when that comes to operation, you just change it. It's the same principle. The operation must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. And the same must be highly provable. For this to be the case, an appropriate level of management to commit to a plan to discontinue the operation. So the good news is the same criteria. So the good thing is the same criteria that you learned under uh, what's it called uh, uh, asset head force is the same under this continued operation, but the measurement differs. So I'll just go straight to the measurements, okay? So let's go straight to the measurement. So for a discontinued operations, okay, when you measure it, what the standard is saying is you must show the total sum or the total or sum of the post-tax profit or loss of the discontinued operation. So that means you are going to compute the post-tax profit or loss. What do you mean of post-tax? That's profit after tax or loss of the discontinued operation. Then the post-tax gain or loss recognized on the measurement of fair value less cost to sell should be represented as a single amount in the statement of profit or loss account. So I'm going to use a question to demonstrate that for you. Even though at this level, I've never seen I can come into this level to test uh, measurement criteria on IFRS 5. But in case it comes up, then something uh, should be able to pull out. But they normally test it regularly on <laughs> in corporate reporting. So that's when you get to the finance, okay? But we still need to look at it. So let me use a question to demonstrate that. Can you see? I can adapt it. So I actually pull it from advanced, uh, uh, what's it called, corporate reporting. So that I can also, because it's, your, it's in your syllabus, so you need to understand that. So let me just go to the requirement. Discuss the conditions which must be met for a non-current asset to be classified as being aired for sale. I'm sure you should be able to do that. Condition seven, you list it immediately. It now said, and explain the accounting treatment that applies. What is that? They are measured at lower account amount and fair value, less cost to sell. So let's look at this question. Bangushi PLC. Is a long established travel agent operating throughout the network of a retail outlet and online store. In recent years, the business has seen its revenue from online store grow strongly and the retail outlet decline significantly. Oh, so what's going on there? Okay. So on 1st July 20X7, sorry, one second. I just realized I, was, I wasn't charging the source of internet. It's funny, man. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, so now the, the, the retail outlet is having serious issue, okay? Because for you to even discontinue an operation, uh, most likely it's uh, generating losses or it's not really performing. Okay, so let me highlight that. Okay, so the retail outlet is declining, has declined significantly. So on 1st July, the board decided to close the retail network in the financial year and put it bidding up for sale. So they closed that operation and they wanted to sell the building. Did you see? So that means it has been discontinued during the year. Remember, we said discontinued operation is a component of an entity that has either been disposed of or is classified as aired for sale. So the directors are seeking advice regarding the treatment of the building in the SFP as well as creating the trading result of the retail division. So the following figures are available, okay? So I give you the kind amount of the building, fair value, less cost sale of the building, and of course, um, other expected cost, cost of closure. So let's look at the requirement. Is that required? Outline the conditions which must be met in order to present the result of an operation as is continued and the accounting treatment. What are you going to tell them? The, uh, the operation must be available for immediate sale in the present condition, and the same must be highly probable. For that to be the case, you now list all those other five. 
can you remember them? A proper level of management must be committed to a plan to discontinue the operation. An active program to locate a buyer must have been initiated. A price offered for the operation must be reasonable in line with its fair value. There's no plan to withdraw the operations from being sold, and the sale is expected to occur within the next one year. So that's what they're asking there. Then what is the accounting treatment? You now say that the total or sum of post-tax profit or loss of the discontinued operation and the post-tax gain or loss, you know, recognized on the measurement of fair value less cost sale must be presented as a single amount in the face of the assessment of profit bit or loss account. So that's what you are telling the examiner. Now, this is exactly what you need to learn. So, so that when you are reading, in fact, this note is highly summarized, okay? So I just went straight to the point. Can you see that? Recognize on the measurement of favor and less cost. So this is what I just quoted for you, okay? So that's what you need to put in your head. So let's now apply this on that question, okay? I'm not going to go to the marker board because I wanted to finish this so that I can close and I can start ISTN next class so that I don't waste time. So let's let's uh, apply this. So the post-tax profit or loss or this continuing operation, the post-tax gain or loss recognized on the measurement of fair value in this cost uh, was uh, presented as a single amount in the face of the account. So what do you do? Now, this is the question. This is online store, Abby, and the retail. And this is uh, 2016 online store and retail. So when I'm preparing 2016, Retail athlete was still existing as a 2016. So that means you will prepare the account. But as at uh, 2017 in July, let me show you from the question. Sorry, I have to be scrolling up and down. I'm trying to manage time. So if you see here, they have discontinued the operation. So at the year end, it will be shown as uh, you just show either profit or loss from the discontinued operation. So you know, we won't show the revenue, the gross profit, no. You just show, you just subsume it into part of the continuing operations, all right? So that's what you are doing. So let me just show you. So from the answer, uh, sorry. Now, if you go and check, uh, let me see whether I can, I have a question here so that I won't be scrolling up and down. Oh. I think I should have it somewhere. Yes, thank God I have it. Now, so if you check the question, go and have the revenue of online and the uh, retail outlet for 2016. That's 48 plus 18. You're going to get 66. So that's how the 66 was gotten. But when you come to 2017, you will only report the revenue of the continuing operation, which from the question is 58.5. Because during the year in July, 1st July, the operation was discontinued. So when I'm preparing my account at the year end, I won't show its revenue. The only thing I will show is either loss or, or profit from the discontinued operations. Does that make sense? Then my cost of sales for 2016, because at that time, retail outlet is still operating. So I add it together. I have 30. So you're adding 16.5 plus 13.5 together so that I can have 30. Then Cost of sales for the current year will be only for the online. So that's why you have 19.5. So you add it together, you have your gross profit. Then you now go to your operating cost. So when I go to my operating cost, as a last year, and we had the 12 plus 7.5, it will give me 19.5, okay? But for the current year, if you look at the question, if you look at the question, we're giving other cost of closure. That was 5.85. So I will add that 5.85 to 15. In your question, you see 15 as your operating cost. So let me show you how it was done. Can you see? As per question, it was 15. Then other cost of, uh, expected cost of closure, 5.85. Okay, so that's what we have here. And everything is 20.85. So that is what we have here. Is that okay? Then, I'll, so when I do that, if I remove that cost from my gross profit, I will now have profit from continuing operations. Did you see that? Profit from continuing operations. Now, the uh, standard is not saying that you must show the post-tax 
profit or loss of the discontinued operations. So when I look at my question, look at profit before tax on your question for the retail outlet in 2017. Profit before tax for the retail outlet. Have you seen it? It was loss actually, because that was 4.5. And that is the post-tax uh, loss, not profit in this case. So that's how you got, we got this uh, 4.5. Did you see that? 4.5, it was a loss. So, you know what? They say profit before tax, it's a loss. So since the post-tax profit or loss, Abi, so when you say post-tax, that is profit after tax. But what we have here is profit before tax. But the issue is this. When a company makes a loss, they don't pay tax. So that means the profit, uh, the loss before tax is also loss after tax. Is that okay? So that's why it's 4.5. Then you now go to the post-tax gain or loss recognized on the, as, uh, on the uh, uh, measurement of fair value, less cost to sell. I will now ask a question. Is there any fair value given to me here? Yeah, we're giving fair value. Did you see it? Fair value less cost to sell of the building is 25.8 million. Have you seen it? Then the kind amount of the building is actually 30 million. So that means that building has suffered in payments. 30 million kind amount, 25.8 uh, uh, 25 million is the fair value less cost to sell. So I will write it down. So the difference between the two of them is 4.2. Did you see? So that if you add it up, you have 8.7. So that's what you now bring into loss for the year from this continued operation. So that you can now have profit for the year to be 9.5 year. And then there was no loss last year, actually. So you can have 16.5. Okay, so that's it. So take your time uh, to look at that. It's quite simple. All you need to learn is uh, the principle of IFRS 5. And you'll be able to solve that question successfully. You have been able to look at I-36, impairment of assets, and I-5, asset aid for sale and discontinued operation. We said an asset is impaired when the current amount is higher than the recoverable amount. If the recoverable amount is higher than the current amount, the asset is not impaired. You continue to carry it at its current amount. Then the recoverable amount of an asset is the higher of fair value less cost to sell and value in use. Impairment loss is the amount at which the kind amount of an asset exceed its recoverable amount. Impairment loss is taken to profit or loss account unless there's a balance in OCI relating to that particular asset, in which case impairment loss will first be taken to the OCI before the balance is now taken to profit or loss account. And I also told you that you only carry out impairment tests if there are indicators of impairment, which can be internal or external indicators. But there are five classes of assets that must undergo impairment review, whether or not there are indicators of impairment. For example, goodwill acquired in business combination, asset classified as held for sale, intangible assets during their development stay, intangible asset with indefinite useful life, okay? they must undergo impairment review. Then we went to cash generating units. If a group of assets has suffered impairment, you must follow three procedures, impair obviously impaired assets, reduce goodwill to zero, and uh, allocate the impairment loss balance to other assets on prorata basis. Then we take a look at the question to demonstrate that. You have a number of other questions that you can practice. Then from there, we checked IFRS 5. We said an asset can only be classified as aired for sale if its kind amount will be recovered through sale rather than continuing use. Then we said there are two conditions that must be met before an asset can be classed as aired for sale. One, the asset must be available for immediate sale in its present condition, and the sale must be highly probable. For that to be the case, five conditions must be met. One, an appropriate level of management must be committed to a plan to sell the asset. An active program to locate the buyer and complete the plan must have been initiated. The price offered for the asset must be reasonably in line with its fair value. There's no plan to withdraw the asset from this sold, and the sale is expected to occur within the next one year. Once those conditions have been met, all of them, not six, not five, all of them must be met 
at the reporting date. Then you can now measure them at the lower of the account amounts and fair value less cost to sell. Once that is done, three things will happen. Assets held for sale must be presented separately on the face of the financial position. Two, they are subject to annual impairment test. Three, they are no longer depreciated. So we need to take a look at that. Then from there, we checked discontinued operations. We say discontinued operation is a component of an entity that has either been disposed of or is classified as aid for sale. Okay, sometimes it represents a separate major line of business or a geographical area of operation. It could also be a subsidiary uh, uh, purchase with a view to resell. So those are discontinued operations. So what are the uh, uh, recognition criteria? It's still the same. The operation must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. And the sale must be highly probable. For that to be the case, you have all those other five conditions. Then for the measurement, the standard is saying you must show the total or sum of the post-tax profit or loss of the discontinued operation and the post-tax gain or loss recognized on the measurement of fair value less cost that must be presented as a single amount on the face of statement of profit or loss account. So this is a single amount in the case of this question. So that's what we have done. So I don't want to bother you with the next standard tonight because time is gone already. So next class by God's grace, um, we'll be taking a look. We'll kick off from IS10 event after the reporting period in 15 minutes. I'm going to take you up on IS10. Then from there, you can look at uh, other standards. But remember, my other colleague is going to meet you. He's going to take you group accounting and the likes. So thank you so much for signing on uh, to SCA online class. So I'm going to see you some other time. So I believe there's no question for me. The chat room is quite... Um, uh, not really busy, okay? So I assume there's no question. But in case um, you are not clear on some terms or, or, or some question or some figures we've gotten, you can chat me up on that particular uh, number. Sorry, I think I missed that number. Let me type it again, 0063324090. 36324090. Okay, so you can pick up that number uh, from the chat room, I'm not sure it's on that uh, particular material, okay, for strategic reasons, okay. All right, so thank you so much, my host. Uh, thank you for holding forth for me. And I'm going to see you guys uh, some other time. Uh, you're going to have a recorded video tomorrow so that I can use it as a way of um, uh, revision, okay. So thank you. Have a very wonderful night rest. So my host, you can decide to end the class. Thank you so very much.